so today uh, we are interested in the study of angiogenesis in, from 2000. I am fully engaged on this story, and uh, we are particularly on the, on the activity of placental growth factor. This gene has been cloned by Gazzella Pricego at our institute. And uh, so, in general, on the family of vascular endothelial growth factor, in the, in the function of this family or growth factor in the, in the regulation of pathological and physiological angiogenesis. And today I want to talk about two topics. The first is uh, the hypoxic modulation of placental growth factor. All of you know that hypoxia is a very crucial stimulus for angiogenesis and that VEGFA is a, a strongly upregulated and very quickly upregulated by hypoxia. While about PLGF, as, about, as often happens, there are controversial data in literature, and then we, start, we decided to start to uh, try to understand if hypoxia modulates angiogenesis. And then I will show you data on specific inhibition of uh, VHF1 R1 receptor by a new molecule that we have identified by screening of combinatorial chemistry. So from the identification of the molecule to the assay in vivo in tumor model and in the age-related macular degeneration model. So, uh, of course, you know that uh, for um, angiogenesis involved in many uh, inflammatory, in many pathological conditions, uh, in particular uh, condition in which there is an increased vascularization like cancer, MD, and other one, and uh, disease in which we have an inhibition of vascularization like all these ischemic events. And then, in this case, we want to try to stop angiogenesis for therapeutic purpose. Here we want to try to stimulate angiogenesis for therapeutic purpose. And this is very recent data in which it has been reported that about um, uh, two billion of people in their life may impact on angiogenesis by different reasons. Uh, and all of you know that uh, we are in the era of anti-angiogenic therapy thanks to the approval of the Avastin and of a different small molecule acting as a TK inhibitor. And this is a, a little uh, table in which it is reported that Icavastin is, uh, uh, has been approved for colon cancer and uh, other cancer uh, disease. Uh, the, the, the impact of these two, of Avastin and Lucentis, that is just the fag fragment of uh, Avastin for uh, age-related macular degeneration, in, it is in development of an aptamer targeting VEGFA-165, and then the two TK inhibitor approved for therapy. It uh, also true that um, the, the impact of antiangiogenesis therapy probably was not so strong as expected, also because uh, 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 the main antiangiogenic therapy target VEGFA, and uh, uh, still, uh, actually, there are many uh, data that uh, uh, indicates how the block of VHF-165 probably is not the, m the correct way to approach the inhibition of vascular endothelial growth factor family, and also with data that we discuss, discuss today seems to indicate that in some condition the presence of VHF-165 is important for the stabilization of vessels. So this is a classical uh, picture of VHF family that you can find in any uh, uh, review, uh, and uh, as uh, you know, VHFA is able to uh, interact with R1 and R2. PLGF and VHFB specifically interact with uh, R1. C and D with R3, R2, and are more involved in lymphoangiogenesis. I want to underline that uh, the situation is, a much, uh, is more complicated. You know that uh, VHFA and PLGF and VHFB, the binding uh, are, are well known, but I want to remember you that VHFA may induce receptor heterodimerization, and that if cell co-express these genes, it, there is the possibility to generate PLGF, VHFA heterodimer, and VHFB, VHFA heterodimer, that for the nature may just bind to R1 or induce receptor heterodimerization. And these, mole these molecules are not able to interact with KDR. So if we have co-expression, we lower the concentration of VGFA and move toward an activation, a higher activation of R1 receptor. Then we have a, a, a new uh, member, gremlins, identified by Marco Presta, that specifically interact with R2. You know that we have a soluble form of receptor 1. That is most important. This is one of the reasons for which our cornea is avascular, and I will show you data uh, during the seminar. 
And uh, this is uh, the unique molecule able to block the activity of all the members of the family. And so this is one of the reasons for which we concentrate our attention to try to inhibit TER1 for a therapeutic approach. And recently, it has been, it has been also reported the soluble form of a receptor 2, and uh, uh, that uh, seems in soluble form to, to be active only on VHGFC and not on VHGFA. So the situation is much more complicated, and there, there are a different equilibrium. Do you have also to consider, do you know that all the members of the family are expressed in different isoforms? And then you, can, you can have also all the possible combination of different isoforms in, dim, in homodimer and heterodimer formation. So the complexity, the complexity of the system is very, very elevated. Uh, it is well known that blocking VHFA or two, there is a strong inhibition of angiogenesis, but in many preclinical data show that also the block of PLGF and of R1 have a, a similar effect, a similar impact on uh, angiogenesis inhibition. And you know that actually there is an anti-PLGF antibody in clinical trials in human. They are starting the phase two uh, for this reason. And this assume, and in particular, uh, assume an, a great importance also because there are a uh, recent report that have indicated that when BHFA is blocked by therapeutic agent, uh, agents, there is an upregulation of the member that specifically bind to FLIT1, so PLGF and BHFB. And then this may generate a compensatory mechanism of drug resistance, in particular in tumors. And this is a, one of the papers that report this kind of aspect. But uh, what is the main role of PLGF and FLIT1. So now we, we talk about the axis PLGF1, FLIT1. So the role of PLGF, uh, in particular of receptor 1, of course, depends from where the receptor is expressed. And it has been demonstrated that FLIT1 is expressed, of course, in all endothelial cells, but is expressed also in many kind of different cells from monocyte macrophage, uh, BM cells, uh, dendritic cells, stromal cells, pericytes, and so on, some tumor cells. And then, of course, uh, probably the main uh, uh, activity of PLGF is uh, act to recruit cells from the environment to the site of neonangiogenesis. There is now great evidence that PLGF, probably the main function of PLGF, is the ability to stimulate the recruitment of inflammatory component of the tumor. So, uh, I, we are talking about uh, PLGF. As I told you before, there are controversial data in literature if PLGF is upregulated or not by epoxia. So we decided to start this study starting with endothelial cells. Um, this is the promoter of PLGF. Probably one of the reasons for which there are controversial data is that uh, the classical study to evaluate if there is a, a transcriptional, transcriptional upregulation of PLGF uh, with cloning the promoter uh, up to reporter gene has not give any kind of important results. Also, if two epoxia responsive elements are located here, but are not functional, for sure there is the uh, um, other role of metal transcription factor one and, and FKB, but not directly related to epoxic stimulus. So we start with the uh, uh, simply a uh, time course experiment to evaluate the upregulation of PLGF in UVAC cells. And as you can see, we have that uh, uh, the, as a control, we evaluate also the upregulation of VEGF. And as you can see, why PLGF start to be immediately upregulated, we have a peak at 12 hours, at 12 hour. PLGF start to be modulated at 12 hours. And uh, uh, if we evaluated after 25 hours, uh, 24 hours by ELISA assay, the concentration of protein in the medium, we can see that we have a very up strong upregulation of placental growth factor. So it seems that may be regulated. And this is a Western blot in which we, it is reported the upregulation of H1, HIF1 alpha to demonstrate that we are effectively in a hypoxic condition. So, um, since the, 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 the transcriptional analysis have not given any kind of, of important or interesting results, we start to evaluate at the epigenetic level if there is a modulation of PLGF gene for expression. 
And uh, we <coughs> start first with the, uh, an evaluation of the methylation, methylation status of the promoter, because uh, on the promoter of PLGF, there is a classical uh, GCP islands. And then we move to uh, uh, do a scanning of PLGF gene by histone acetylation. So when we did the evaluation of uh, methylation by bisulfite analysis, as you can see, we don't have a very kind of a, any um, methylation signature. Here, we have, you see uh, for each lane represent one clone, and each uh, uh, row represent um, the uh, uh, CPG duplex, and the black circle are methylated uh, 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 bases, the white are not methylated. As you can see, there is a no particular signature of methylation. There is uh, any difference between normosic and hypoxic con concent uh, concentration of uh, conditions. Uh, so we move to uh, PLGF scanning for histone acetylation. So uh, this is a, a schematic part of the gene, the first part of the gene, okay? So we analyze different area uh, of the gene by real-time PCR. Of course, we have a, 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 a one region is just the promoter of the of PLGF. And then when we do uh, a chip analysis, we observe a, a com chromatin immunoprocessation analysis for H3 and H4. We observe, of course, uh, a signal at level of, R of the region B, so in the promoter, but it was expected, of course. But what was in interesting is that we found a very strong signal of Ixon acetylation at the level of the region C, so in the second intron of the gene. So we go to, well, see this second intron, and what we observe is that there are three hypoxy responsive elements never described before in the second intron of PLGF gene. Uh, so to... Uh, to be sure that uh, uh, this area of the gene is uh, interested by the binding of uh, epoxy responsive element, we performed a, a, com, a chip analysis with, with for H1, uh, HIF1 alpha. And as you can see, we were able to detect a good signal at the level of the second intron of PLGF. So H, H, uh, IF one alpha effectively bind the PLGF gene at the second intron. Here you can see the analysis also by, uh, to, to um, see the, band, the DNA band amplified. And here you can see that this is a positive control performed of human PLGF gene. So effectively, H1, HIF one alpha is able to bind the, <coughs> the uh, second intron of PLGF gene. Uh, above the uh, three sequence, t the three hypoxy responsive element identified, probably the first one is the, the active one because uh, when we look at the sequence, we noted that was the unique uh, uh, HRA element that, uh, showing also uh, at uh, its three prime these other sequences that is strongly conserved in HRA active elements. And this uh, uh, se uh, sequence is uh, uh, conserved in the second intron of PLGF gene also in other species, while which we look at also for VHF A gene, VHF B, B gene, and the other gene of the family. No one has uh, this uh, hypoxy responsive element in the second intron of the gene. So uh, to confirm the data, we uh, knocked down the expression of H1, HIF uh, in uh, UX cells, and uh, we uh, observed, practically, we were able to, to cancel the, the DAP regulation that hypoxia uh, generate for uh, the expression of PLGF, both at real time, uh, at RNA level, and at protein level. So the specific uh, knockdown of, C of H1, HIF effectively inhibit the upper regulation that hypoxia generate for the expression of PLGF. So uh, uh, we uh, move to mouse to confirm the data observed in endothelial cells, in human endothelial cells. We move to mouse endothelial cell line, and we did the, practically the same analysis. We observed that in, in hypoxia condition, there is an upper regulation of PLGF uh, starting from we have a strong upregulation, 12 hours, 
and at 24 hours we see an upregulation of the protein. Then we perform a chip analysis. This is the area of the second intron where the hypoxia responsive element is located. It is just one sequence in mouse. And uh, uh, when we did the chip analysis, once again, we observed for uh, uh, H3 and H4 instance, we uh, still observe an activity in the area of the promoter and an activity in the area of the second intron. And uh, when we uh, knock down uh, HIF uh, in mouse, we uh, uh, con uh, were able to cancel the upregulation induced by proxia at level of uh, RNA, RNA and at level of protein for PLGF. So it seems that in endothelium, effectively, there is this kind of modulation. So uh, we uh, also uh, try to uh, verify if each IF2 alpha is able to bind to the second region of PLGF promoter. Also because it has been reported that in endothelial cells, probably HIF2 alpha is the major a form of the, uh, of the transcription factor present. But as you can see, HIF2 uh, it was not able to interact with the area of the second intron of PLGF. So it seems that it's mediated specifically by HIF alpha. And of course, we don't see, we try also to uh, uh, knock down uh, HIF2 alpha, and as you can see, there is any difference in the, in the, in the uh, knocked, knocked uh, sam uh, samples compared to the controls. So it seems that HIF2 alpha is not involved in this kind of revolution. Then we move to um, tumor cells. <coughs> to verify if also in tumor cells there is a modulation by, or by proxia or PLGF. Also because it has been reported that cells that normally do not express PLGF in vitro, once implanted in vivo, for example in the xenograft experiments, start to express PLGF. So we, we want, are of course interested to understand what happens in tumor cells. And uh, as for all uh, uh, things, regarding PLGF, we start to see different things. As you can see, we uh, observed an, an, an upregulation of PLGF in hypoxia, for example, in some cell lines, but not in other one. And when, uh, OK, sorry, non risco. OK. And uh, when we analyze by real-time PCR and ELISA, you can see that the cell line uh, expressing PLG, uh, in which there is an, uh, an upregulation of PLGF by proxia, we effectively were able to observe this upregulation. This is a negative control because these cells do not express PLGF in hypoxia, and indeed do not express PLGF. And the same at protein level. Uh, so we analyzed also human tumor cell line, and also here we found that some cell line express, in this case just one, do not express P PLG, in, in just one, there is not induction of PLGF by hypoxia. And uh, also in this case, we confirm the data by real-time PCR and uh, human, and uh, LISA. Sorry, this is the mouse tumor cell line. And the previous one was the human. I inverted the, the terms. Uh, so uh, we uh, go to verify if uh, there is the same situation of endothelial cells by, uh, we perform the chip analysis to verify in the second, if the second intron of PLGF is involved in this story, and we cannot find any kind of signal. So as you can see, we, when analyzed the uh, human cells in which there is, a, uh, s uh, in which there is a regulation of PLGF by proxia, we just observe a signal at, uh, at promotor level, uh, while, of course, in cells negative for the upregulation of PLGF, we don't see any kind of signals by uh, uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation assay for histone H3 and H4. And uh, the same when we analyze two mouse cell lines uh, in which there is upregulation of PLGF by hypoxia, we can see just a signal at promoter level, but not at level of the second intron. So indicating probably that in two more cells there is a completely different situation at, epi at ep epigenetic level that do not, do not allow almost in the time and the condition that we have analyzed to uh, 
uh, to have the same kind of, of response observed in endothelial cells. Uh, so in, in, at, at this moment, we have this kind of situation. So when there is hypoxia, we have an upregulation of PLGF that is mediated by HIF1 alpha in the human and mouse endothelial cells. Why? Also, if we observe an upregulation in some human tumor cells and some mouse tumor cells, we still don't know which, which is the mechanism that uh, mediates the response to uh, hypoxia for the PLGF gene. So let's move to the second part of, of my talk uh, that is on the specific inhibition of uh, R1 for, uh, to, for uh, uh, inhibit pathological angiogenesis. I have to start from, this, uh, uh, that, from the data of this manuscript that we are published in 2010. Uh, uh, we, uh, in this paper, I hypothesized that uh, we have generated a variant of PLGF that is still able to generate heterodimer with VEGFA, but is not able to bind to FLIT1 receptor. So it may act as a sort of a dominant negative of VEGFA, because if it's overexpressed in cells, we can generate the heterodimer. So this means that we lower the concentration of active VGFA. And this is the case. So we, in this way, practically reduce the concentration of VGFA, because, and these two uh, proteins are not able to interact to the receptor thanks to the mutation that we have uh, generated in PLGF gene. So the effect was a decrease of VGFA activity. And we uh, ob obtained the results in two different ways. So we generated the stable clones of the human tumor cell line over expressing PLGF DA or, or as controlled PLGF wild type. And also we did gene therapy approach with adenovirus. Uh, using adenovirus uh, with intratumoral injection of the viruses. So we have these two different kind of situations. When we overexpress the variant PLGF1DA, we, we have two inactive proteins and we, we reduce the concentration of EGF. When we overexpress over PLGF1 wild type, we uh, reduce the concentration of EGF A, but we have two active proteins, the homodimer PLGF and the heterodimer. And this is just to show you that when we did the transfection and we selected the stable clones, we observed practically a reduction of human VEGF of about 50%. The appearance of the heterodimer, the concentration is, a, is about two times the, the value of reduction because for each molecule of VEGF A subtracted, two molecules of heterodimer may be formed. And of course, we have an overexpression of PLGF. So what we observe when injected in vivo these cells was that only the cells transfected with our variant show a very strong inhibition of tumor. So because we are reducing VEGFA activity. While the overexpression of PLGF wild type does not give any kind of difference with the control. So this means that also if VEGF is reduced, the presence of active PLGF and active heterodimer is able to rescue the decrease of VEGFA in terms of tumor boom. So we did the same on the same cell line using adenovirus. So this is just to show that the adenovirus were able to infect the cells. And this was the protocol. So we inject the tumor. When the tumor reached a volume of about 200 milligram after 10 days, we inject intratumorally the viruses. And then we repeat the injection after seven days. So what we observed was practically the same things. So we observed that only injecting viruses for PLGF1, the E variant, show a very strong inhibition of tumor go, while the control, the, the, the injection of viruses for PLGF wild type did not give any kind of difference compared to controls. So when we do histochemical analysis of tumor, we observed that in terms of vessel density, we don't have difference between the overexpression of PLGF and the, and the control, while when we express uh, our variant, we have a very strong inhibition of vessel normalization. But the presence of overexpression of PLGF, what, what change in tumor? It's possible that the overexpression of PLGF, so the presence of PLGF and of active heterodimer does not have any kind of function of cells. But what we analyzed, vessel stabilization uh, and uh, infiltrate and uh, inflammatory infiltrate in tumors 
As you can see, we still observe with our variant reduction compared to control for both uh, vessels, MA positive cells, and F4, F4 AT positive cells area. But in this case, the overexpression of PLGF strongly upregulates both kind of cells in tumor. So the activation of free 2 one receptor is important to recruit both inflammatory cells and to stabilize the, ves the vessels by small positive cells. And uh, uh, the, the same happens when we analyze tumor generated by, um, by uh, stable cones over expressing PLGFD or PLGF wild type. In this case, we can see also another variant in which we have expressed a new variant of PLGF that has uh, did not change its ability, was a positive control, did not change its ability to generate heterodimer or to bind the receptor. And in fact, the activity was similar to all type. And also in this case, uh, we see a strong upregulation of SMA positive vessels and of F of uh, uh, inflammatory cells infiltration in cells over expressing the uh, PLGF. So also uh, based on these results, uh, we start to, uh, some years ago, to identify small molecules able to prevent the activity of FLIT1 receptors. Uh, we did an, an, a, a, a screening with, uh, based on an ELISA assay, very simple, the receptor, recombinant receptor encoding, the protein and the inhibitors, and then an antibody able to recognize the proteins. And we have screened several different combinatorial peptide library, but the, uh, the ones that give us the best result was a tetrameric tripeptide uh, uh, library. So this is just four times the, the same tripeptide sequence connected by a, a, a lysine core, okay? So we have a, a molecule that has four arm, identical arms. And these are some of the other advantages to use this kind of chemistry. When we start to synthesize the, the library for the screening, we decide to use a natural amino acid. So this with the idea that if we are able to identify some molecules, active molecules, probably these molecules are more stable in vivo because the amino acids are not, are not natural. So we have 30 different amino acids, all the forms of the amino acid and some chemical modified amino acid. So in total, since we have a tripeptide library and the, uh, amino acid we used it to build the library was 30, so the complexity of the library was 27,000 molecules arranged in 30 different pools. So we have that in, this is the, in the first pools, we have in the first position the, alan, the alanine and the second and third position are random. In the second pool we have the asparagine and so on. In this, case, in, this way, in this way, if we have a, an active pool that inhibits the interaction, we have also identified what is the first amino acid that uh, uh, compose the molecule uh, active. Then we take this pool and we resynthesize the library, fixing the first position that will be always the amino acid identified. The second will identify the pool that is still random. And so with three cycles of synthesis and screening, we were able to identify a single active molecule. And uh, this molecule was in, uh, present in first position, the diglutamic, in second position, the L-cysteine S-benzyl, and the third position, the l cyclohexyl alanine. So this is the schematic structure, this is the molecule, okay? So this molecule was able to inhibit the interaction between placental go factor and FLIT1. So the first thing we do, dose-dependent assay for PLGF, and we check immediately if this molecule is able to prevent also the binding of other members of the family to receptor 1. So placental go factor VHFA and VHFB. And as you can see, the peptide was able to inhibit all three, the interaction of all three members. The EC50 for these two was about 7, 8 micromolar. Here was a little bit more elevated. The tetrameric stru structure is absolutely crucial because if we change the structure, the molecule loses the ability to bind to the receptor. This is the binding of human FLIT1 or mass FLIT1 to the, tetra to the molecule. And as you can see, if we use a dimer, if we change one of the three amino acids with alanine, or if we use a control peptide and the other control peptide, we lose the binding of a receptor to this molecule. Uh, most importantly, we observed that this molecule does not 
is, is not able to interact with vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 2, and this was another crucial aspect. So the molecule is specific for VEGFR1. This is also confirmed by uh, phosphorylation experiments. So this is a, the phosphorylation of a receptor 1 stimulated by PLGF. This is the two concentration of our peptide, as, as you can see, we, very, we observed an inhibition. This is a control peptide. This is an antibody anti PLGF. So the molecules work also inhibiting the phosphorylation of the receptor, stimulated by PLGF, stimulated by VEGF. As you can see here, we observe a reduction of phosphorylation compared to the uh, activation of VEGF. This is a, a negative uh, the, mm, control performed with the antibody. This is the uh, control peptide. And conversely, is not able to inhibit phosphorylation of the receptor 2. So the, effectively, this peptide binds to the receptor 1 and specifically inhibits the activity and the activation of this, uh, of this receptor. This is the stability for seven days in serum. As you can see, practically after seven days, our molecule is fully stable in serum. And this is thanks to the choice, to the previous choice, to use a natural amino acid in synthesis. This is a, one of the classical essay, capillary like tube formation, uh, positive control, negative control. As you can see, when, sti when we stimulate the capillary with <coughs> placental growth factor of VHF, and we had the peptide, we practically are able to fully block the uh, capillary like tube formation. This do not happens with the two different control peptide used at 50 micromolar. Uh, and then we uh, evaluate for the first time in vivo the activity of this molecule in an assay that uh, uh, paradoxically stimulates the angiogenesis. Why? Because we choose the cornea as platform. The cornea is avascular, and the avascularity of the cornea is maintained by the high expression of soluble receptor 1. Because despite this avascular, the cornea express vascular endothelial growth factor, but its activity is prevented by the presence of soluble factor 1. So the situation is this one. In cornea, we have VEGFA, which activity is upregulated, is blocked by soluble receptor 1. So you consider that when we sleep and then we close our eyes, the cornea become hypoxic, and there is an upregulation of VEGF of two times, and an upregulation of the soluble receptor of eight times. So this just a, is a very controller of the vascularity of the cornea. This has been, been demonstrated by biochemistry, genetical approach in very different way. In the, one of the ways in which this was demonstrated is, was uh, that if we inject an antibody, anti flit one receptor, practically there is a displacement of VEGFA that is able to, activate, to, act, to move and to uh, activate the endothelium of the vessels localized in the limbus, and then the, uh, uh, the proliferation, the angiogenesis starts, and the vessel invade the cornea. Okay? So what, um, in, in our case, we have a peptide that exactly do what this antibody do, so interact with FLIT1, and then probably we inject the peptide, hoping to see neovascularization of the cornea. And this is exactly what we obtained inject a different concentration of the peptide. As you can see, we start to see vascularization at low concentration. The vascularization increase, increasing the concentration, and we have a fully vascularization of the cornea, injecting 20 nanomole of the peptide. When we inject the control peptide, we don't see any kind of vascularization. So at the end, uh, let's we move to tumor model. So one of the problems of this molecule was its solubility. It's very difficult to, sh to solubilize this peptide. And uh, uh, to inject in vivo, of course, EP, we, we need to dissolve the molecule. We try many different kind of approach, different uh, adjuvants. At, at the end, we observed that when we dissolve the peptide in this solution, so PEG 400 water, we obtain a very nice suspension of the peptide. So we can left the suspension for days at room temperature. There is no precipitation of the molecule. So it seems a very good suspension. And then we start to inject this molecule in this way. Of course, the vehicle was used as control. And also, the control peptide was, in, was solubilized in the same manner. 
In the fifth instance, we um, use a syngenic colon, mouse colon model, also because we want to compare the activity of the peptide with the anti-PLGF that now is in clinical trials and with Avastin, of course. And what we observed first in mouse, also because in mouse was interesting, because when we use antibody, anti-mouse PLGF, in a mouse model, this antibody block not only the mouse PLGF produced by the tumors, but also the mouse PLGF produced by accessory cells, like inflammatory cells and dotilla cells that, of course, are of mouse. When we, de we, will, uh, we use uh, anti-PLGF in a xenograft model, in that case, we use anti-PLGF directed against the human PLGF that not act on mouse PLGF, and then on PLGF produced by endo endogenous PLGF. So as you can see, we inject the peptide at 50 milligram kilo each two days. And what we observed was a very, very strong inhibition of tumor goo compared to the control and to the vehicle and to the control peptide. And uh, the molecule act better than the anti-PLGF, okay? So it seems that in, at, this con at that concentration and this condition, the peptide is very useful molecule. So we start to analyze the, uh, by immunosochemical analysis the tumors, and as you can see, we observe a similar inhibition in terms of vessel density for the, the tumors uh, developed in mice treated with anti-PLGF antibody and peptide. But when we analyze the F480 infiltration, as you can see, we observe a very, very strong inhibition of uh, inflammatory infiltrate in, uh, in um, tumors developed in mouse treated with our peptide better than that observed with blocking PLGF, as expected, of course. Then we move to human model. And uh, it was very uh, striking for us to see that peptide practically works like Avastin in a very comparable manner. The molecule, uh, uh, the red line, act better than the human PLGF. And uh, of course, the difference compared to the vehicle and to the control peptide was uh, important differences. So we did the analysis, and once again, we observed a similar inhibition for compared to PLGF. The inhibition of acid gives a much stronger in, in inhibition of vessel density, also if there is not <coughs> significant different difference between the treated mice, and this is just to show you some representative images of the controls and of the tumors treated with the agents. So once again, when we did F4 positive area, we see a, an impressive impress, uh, inhibition of inflammatory infiltration in tumors. And as you can see, the peptide work better than elastin, they work better than anti-PLGF. And once again, this is just some representative pictures. And also the vessel stabilization evaluated by counting the vessel covered by cells positive to smooth muscolactin was, was lower in all three the uh, treated animals. Uh, okay. Um, and this is just some representative images. So, um, we uh, start to see if we can lower the concentration of the molecule. We start with 50 milligram kilo based on the uh, um, micromolar activity in vitro and also on empirical calculation that you, we, you can do evaluating the total volume of the blood in the mice and blah, blah, blah. So we decided to, to try to lower the concentration. So we repeated once again the experiment and we used the molecule at 25 and at 10 milligram kilo. And as you can see, when we lower to 25 milligram kilo, we still see a perfect uh, match between the tumor go observe the trading of the animals with peptide or with avastin, while when we use a 10 milligram kilo, there is a slight difference with the control, but the, the molecule lose uh, the activity. The difference was not significant. So we lower the concentration to 25 milligram kilo. We try also to deliver the molecule in uh, not each day, but uh, uh, in more delay a day, and the molecule was not active. So. Uh, 48 hours, 25 milligram kilo are the better condition that we are obtaining. 
And finally, and this is a very, very recent results, just one week ago, we, uh, and the, the experiment is still ongoing, we try to verify if this molecule may act in combination with the uh, standard chemotherapy uh, actually used for humans, so the forefil that is composed by three different molecules, flu five fluorouracil, um, irinotecon, that is a camptotacin, and uh, the oxalate platinum. So of course in mouse we use one of the three drugs, so we choose irinotecon, and when we did the experimental combination, we observed this. So this is a, the, once again, the vehicle. The inhibition observed with Avastin and peptide was still similar. At the same time, the uh, irinotecon delivered at 550 milligram kilo one time a week give a similar inhibition, but what was really impressive is the combination. As you can see, after the second injection, practically, of irinotecan, we start to see a very strong uh, uh, synergic effect. Consider that from day 21, uh, yes, 21, practically uh, five out of the uh, seven uh, animals of the group, the, the two more disappeared, so this, this uh, Three point is related just to uh, two tumors only. At day 28, we explanted all tumors. And as you can see, we are still following the, 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 the experiment. We particularly fully block the, 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 the tumor. But uh, as, uh, of course, happens ever, the tumor start to regrow with a delay of about 20 days. That's a very long time, a very long uh, time. Uh, of, of, uh, in which the tumor is a, in, a, in, a, in a stopped, in a blocked uh, situation. So as the effectively, targeting FLIT1 is possible to have a very strong effect, very strong anti-tumoral effect. And uh, most important, this, uh, uh, this target may be inhibited and the, the, the inhibition may be coordinated with other chemotherapeutic agents. Of course, we, uh, we, when we stop at this experiment, we will start with a new one. We have to compare the combination of irinotecan plus peptide with irinotecan plus avastin. It has already been done, of course, in literature, and uh, the effect was very similar. There is a disappearance of the tumor and then a reappearance of the tumor, but of course, we have to do this in our hands. And finally, what, what probably has given me the great confidence that this is a, is a, a very interesting molecule in developing um, perspective was that, uh, ah, sorry, okay, this is the same images. Uh, stop at 28 days, just show you in a more, uh, in a different way. Was this experiment. So we did protein extracts of the tumors, so we mix equimoco, equi, uh, equivalent amount in terms of microgram of each exat, and we analyze the by Western bot. And as you can see, the peptide has a very strong ability to block FLIT1 phosphorylation in vivo. We have this anti, anti phosphoflit one antibody that work in a fantastic way. It recognizes both human and mouse. And unfortunately, the anti flit one to normalize the experiment <laughs> do not work in the same manner. It's very difficult in the tumor extract to observe very real, clear uh, bands, but these are, in terms of, a, of a molecular weight, probably these are FLIT1. But it's really impressive to see how our peptide fully block FLIT1, or strongly inhibit FLIT1 phosphorylation. Avastin give a partial inhibition compared to the vehicle to iron it, idinotecan, and this is the combination in which practically the peptide, the, 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 the signal of FLIT1 seems uh, fully blocked. Also because it seems that the, the idinotecan de per se determine, determine an inhibition of VAGFA. And uh, at the end of the story, we have a final confirmation of activity of our molecule in the age-related macular degeneration model. So you know that Avastin and Lucentis are given for age-related macular degeneration, a VGFA-based disease. Um, and then it's possible there is a, a model uh, uh, that is, uh, is performed generating some damages on the uh, branch membrane that, is a uh, that separate the choroid vascularized area, vascularized area from the retina. 
And when uh, the laser uh, generates this damage, there is an invasion of the vessels of the area of the retina uh, from the choroid to the retina, okay? And it's possible to give the damage. We have uh, injected the peptide one time, so at day zero, we perform the damage, and we inject anti-VEGFA, our peptides at two different concentrations, and then we observe the effect after seven days. Just one injection and the analysis after seven days. And this is the results. So we have a very, very good dose-dependent inhibition of choroid neovascularization. The experiment was performed by Professor Rambati. We have a collaboration, some collaboration with Dr. Rambati in Kentucky. He's one of the leading experts for local neovascularization and called me by phone asking me what you have given me because with anti-VHFA, it's very difficult to go low to obtain a, a, um, an inhibition much stronger than this compared to the control. While with our molecule, we were able to, go, to, ob uh, to obtain about 75%. This is the limit of the methodic, okay? It's impossible to see an inhibition more stronger than this. So this molecule is um, also able, like Avastin, to inhibit choroid neovascularization. So in summary, um, I think that uh, the use of peptide in, uh, means that uh, to see a strong effect, we, in particular, also considering the inflammatory component of the tumor and uh, vessel coverage, uh, uh, it's important that uh, we um, target more uh, uh, target, more different uh, actors. At blocking VEGF, FLIT1, we are blocking uh, VEGF-A, VEGF-B, and PLGF almost for the activity, for VEGFA, for its activity via this receptor. The, the other thing is that small molecule may be used to prevent the first event needed for the, for the activity of this molecule. So the binding of the molecule with the receptor, okay? So also small molecule may act in this way. Uh, that block of fleet one seems to be equivalent to that observed almost in our hands with uh, Avastin. And that uh, uh, um, the peptide that I did not can give is a synergic inhibition activity. So, uh, in conclusion, let me thank uh, uh, Maria Matarazzo and Maurizio Desporito, our two colleagues of the Institute, ex expert in uh, uh, um, epigenetic chip analysis, and then we are doing the job uh, of the evaluation of uh, modulation of PLGF in collaboration with these two peoples. So, Menotti is. Uh, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, uh, friends, uh, and my personal chemist, as I call him, because he has synth synthesized all the peptide library that we have screened and so on. And uh, uh, Jay Ambati for the collaboration with the experiment on uh, uh, the models. So the two granting agencies without uh, the, the, the support, uh, of course, we, all this job was not possible. And this is my small group, uh, Laura, Ivana, Valeria, that in this moment, uh, she's doing a postdoc in the lab of Ambati. Gabriele is a technician. And all the staff of the, our animal house, because it's a real uh, support staff for all the in vivo experiment. And thank you very much for your attention.